John chapter 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one, like, no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. Today's uh, sermon is I call Friends of Virtue, and it's a certain kind of friendship that I'd like to talk about today. And this painting here you may have seen in the National Gallery. It's a very old painting from the 1500s, 1400s, and it depicts hopefully a scene that we can recognize, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I'm going to return to this later. But in the course of my preparation, I came across this meme there's a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. And I want to assure you that I have no idea what that means. <laughs> Another of my favorite paintings in the National Gallery is this huge painting by Paolo Veronese. It depicts a scene after a dramatic battle by Alexander the Great. He has just defeated the Persians. Uh, King uh, Darius III has fled the battlefield. He was so confident in his power, Darius, that he had brought his family and his treasury with him. And they wound up uh, leaving, he wound up leaving his family and his treasury in the hands of Alexander the Great. And this scene is, depicts Alexander, and the family has come before him, and the king's mother, who you see in the blue, has uh, pleaded for mercy. But she made one mistake. She decides that she didn't know who Alexander was, so she falls in front of the person that she thinks is Alexander. And it turned out to be Alexander's best friend, Hephaestion. And as the legend goes, Alexander was very gracious and said, he too is Alexander. And that sort of sums up the friendship that Alexander has with Hephaestion. See, you see Alexander in the red, he's gesturing to his friend Hephaestion, that is Alexander, and Hephaestion is sort of taken aback by the fact that he would be called Alexander, when in fact he was just the second in command. And uh, the, the family is, is, is highly embarrassed, but Alexander is very gracious about it. So I want to tell you about the friendship that Hephaestion shared with his friend Alexander. He was Alexander's closest friend, confidant, and colleague. Uh, they, he was a general in the command of many troops, the closest troops to Alexander. He was a diplomat. He negotiated on behalf of Alexander. Remember, Alexander was one of the greatest generals ever to, to uh, dominate, and his battle tactics are still studied today in military academies. And he was a childhood friend of Alexander. They grew up together. They learned to fight. And they were very uh, close, extremely close. And unfortunately, he died after a fever. And 
This is what historians know as more profound than any of uh, the things that Alexander actually accomplished was the death of his friend. And I, I bring this up as an illustration of the friendship that these two had. Alexander, if you could summarize it, was uncontrollable grief over the death of his close friend. He had all the horse veins and horse tails shaved off. He had uh, he demolished the battlements of nearby cities. The battlements are the tops of the walls of the castles where uh, the soldiers will hide when they shoot their arrows and defend the city. So he had them all demolished uh, of the cities that he had conquered. And he did not eat for something up to three days, supposedly, lying on the floor, just weeping uncontrollably. And he banned music. And perhaps the most uh, extreme example of his grief was he executed the doctor, uh, Lausius, for apparently malpractice. So this is the extent of the love that Alexander had, the, sh the trust, the care that he had. And this is my introduction to the whole idea of friendship. How are we making our friends today? As we look into the new year, we're going to be we're meeting new friends, and we have to decide, well, do we start new friendships? Do we maintain uh, current friendships? Do we let old friendships pass away, like just kind of fade into the background? We have, uh, this is how I'm going to structure my, my presentation, we have a need for human friendship. Uh, there are different kinds of friendships. And then we have to ask ourselves, what friendship do we need the most? As we sort out all the friendships that we have, there are some that I think we should pay more attention to. Let's start in the beginning. Uh, this guy named Adam in the Garden of Eden. He's by himself. We know that uh, things are perfect. Uh, he's naming all the animals. Uh, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Read Genesis 1, verse 31. So everything is perfect. And Adam is there enjoying the garden by himself. But there's a problem. God says that Adam was alone and that it was not good. In Genesis 2, we read, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So you have to ask yourself, why did God say that Adam was alone when Adam had perfect relationship with God? What was it about Adam's situation that it was that God had to say, it is not good for man to be alone? And we see here that he had to, God created a human to be a companion to Adam. <coughs> now I'm going to switch over to uh, another scene in the Bible. This is uh, Elijah, and there's a famine in Israel due to Baal worship. King Ahab is now ruling the northern tribes of Israel called the Northern Kingdom, and he is sinning grievously because he married Queen Jezebel. Jezebel is a worshiper of Baal and other idols, and so God has pronounced a judgment on Israel, saying that there will be no rain. Elijah says there will be no rain for a long period of time, and uh, the crops are suffering, everybody's suffering. And then Elijah decides to challenge the prophets of Baal. And we have this very famous confrontation between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Car Carmel. And he says, let's set up identical sacrifices. And Elijah said, uh, you know, let the prophets of Baal call down uh, fire from heaven or however, consume the sacrifice, and then I'll do the same thing. And it's quite an entertaining story. Elijah gets a little sarcastic at times because the priests, the prophets, continue, 450 of them, continue to dance around. They cut themselves up. They're screaming. They're yelling. Elijah goes, yell more. Maybe God, maybe Baal is sleeping. And ultimately, nothing happens, as can be expected. So, after several hours, they give up, and Elijah says, okay. He makes it harder for his sacrifice. He pours barrels of water, buckets of water, over his sacrifice 
to make it even harder for the sacrifice to be consumed. The water is filling the trench, and then we have the dramatic moment where Elijah prays and says, Oh God, you know, show, uh, show them your power. And sure enough, God destroys the sacrifice, which destroys the stones, it dries all the water. And in a dramatic display of heavenly power, the sacrifice is consumed. Uh, we can see the uh, Baal sacrifice still waiting there, waiting for any kind of uh, action. And this en en empowers Elijah to slaughter the prophets of Baal. 450 prophets are killed, and Elijah is leading the charge. And then the rain comes to allow the, uh, so that now the, the evil has been purged from the land and the rain can now fall on Israel. And so <coughs> Elijah tells Ahab, you better get going before the rain stops you. But miraculously, Elijah is carried along by the power of God and he outruns the chariot for quite some distance. This is not a short 100 meter sprint. This is a rather long distance to go from the top of a mountain down to a city called Jezreel, or a valley of Jezreel. And so Elijah experiences, he sees the power of God, he experiences the power of God. Well, Ahab goes home with his tail tucked up between his legs, and he tells his wife, Queen Jezebel. And Jezebel, instead of reacting, oh, wow, I should do something, I should repent, I should you know, pay attention to this God, she says that I'm going to kill Elijah. And she sends a messenger to tell Elijah, uh, you're going to be like one of those prophets. And so what does Elijah do? Well, he has seen the power of God. He now gets this threat against his life. Elijah runs for his life with his servant. And he's running, running, running. And so remember that he's all the way up north in Jezreel. Here's a map. So Jezreel, he, he runs from Mount Carmel down to Jezreel. Then he, uh, he runs through Samaria, which is the capital of the northern uh, kingdom, the kingdom of uh, Israel. But he decides to keep running all the way down to Beersheba, which is all the way in the, king, the southern tribes, the kingdom of Judah. And according to internet sources, it's about 100 miles. And, uh, but he keeps running. He is so afraid of Jezebel that he is going to run clear out of the country, almost, yeah, clear out of the country. He leaves his servant behind in Beersheba, and he goes alone. And then we come to this very depressing detail. He, he, he lies under, he sits under a broom tree and says, a bush, he says, I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. So once again, we have someone who has seen uh, the, the extreme power of God, I mean, direct intervention. And now he has come to this. He wants to die. And we have to ask ourselves, well, how can Elijah have come to this kind of situation? He wants to die. He, he, remember, he regularly receives messages from God. He has performed numerous miracles by the power of God by now. He didn't just start. He's been doing miracles all along. He has seen God's fire consume the sacrifice. He outruns a chariot, and yet he wants to die. And I'm going to just leave that hanging there, and we'll come back to this in a minute, because now we're going to move to the New Testament. And it's all about John the Baptist. <coughs> and in our first scene here, we have Elizabeth on our left visiting Mary. And if you remember, we're going to hopefully hear this in our Christmas uh, story soon, that John the Baptist, who's in the womb, he's uh, five months old, he leaps as soon as Elizabeth comes to meet Mary. And so we, we, know, we realize that John the Baptist has recognized the Messiah uh, in utero, the first person to quite possibly recognize the Messiah. John the Baptist grows up. He's preaching repentance. He tells people you know, to repent because uh, the Messiah is coming. And then he has the honor of baptizing Jesus. And he baptizes Jesus, and then he 
He hears the voice of the God. Uh, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And he sees the Holy Spirit descending like a dove on Jesus. So John the Baptist experiences all this firsthand. As he continues his ministry, he is now uh, pointing out, and, and the very famous phrase from the King James, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, look, the Lamb of God, newer translations. So he's pointing out Messiah. He recognizes who the Messiah is. But John's preaching uh, is gets him into trouble. And he's arrested by King Herod, one of the, one of the Herods. Not Herod the Great, he's died. One of his sons is also called Herod. Actually, all of Herod's sons are called Herod. This is one of the Herods. And he's thrown into prison. And Matthew 11 records, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? So let's get this straight here. He recognized Jesus whilst in the womb. He baptized Jesus, heard God's voice, saw the dove, and he points Jesus out to others. And yet, he wonders if Jesus is the Messiah. In other words, John the Baptist is experiencing a crisis of faith. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is that? What accounts for that? And I'm going to leave that hanging and come back to that in a minute. Because now I'm going to contrast Elijah and John the Baptist with Jesus. And Jesus is going through the most difficult point in his life. And so here in the verses, Matthew 26, 36 to 38. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He was telling his disciples, the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, uh, the two sons of Zebedee are James and John, to stay here and keep watch with me. So what does that tell you? Well, what it tells me is that Jesus needed Peter, James, and John to be with him in the most difficult part of his life. And here's the question. Why did Jesus need his sinful human friends to be with him even though he's sinless and he has a perfect relationship with God the Father. Remember, he's going out every morning to pray for hours, and yet, in the most difficult time, he needs his three human friends to be with him. And that, I think, should make us think, well, what does the Bible show about friends? Adam needed a human friend despite having a perfect relationship with God, a perfect friendship with God. Remember that Adam being by himself, this was before the fall, before the sin. So before sin entered the world, Adam still needed uh, a human relationship. Uh, Elijah's severe, severe relationship came when he was not with friends, even though he saw and felt God's dramatic power. And there were many instances of, of Elijah experiencing that power, and yet he says, I want to die. John the Baptist's wavering faith in Jesus came at a time when he was alone prison. And Jesus relied on his sinful human friends during his worst time here on earth. And I would like to suggest that this, to me, shows that we have a need for friendship, but not just any kind of friendship. And so I have to uh, go to a favorite philosopher of mine who happened to be uh, related to Alexander the Great. His name is Aristotle. And he was Alexander the Great's tutor until age 16. As a matter of fact, Aristotle died one year after Alexander the Great did. Uh, Alexander the Great died in 323 BC, and then Aristotle dies in 322. Uh, he, uh, Aristotle was a student of philosopher Plato. You may have heard of Plato. Plato was a student of Socrates. So Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And much of his philosophy, of Aristotle's philosophy, is still relevant today. And I think uh, his writings on friendship could help inform us as we think about this, the, the idea of friendship. So he had three different kinds 
of friends here. Uh, virtue, pleasure, and utility. <coughs> the tech problem has uh, changed the font size here. So uh, virtue on the top, pleasure, and then utility. Well, what are those kinds of, of friendships? Well, utility, I have sort of been flexible with Aristotle. People you recognize. So we are friends of utility here. We all come together for a common purpose, and then we leave, and then we go back and do our own thing. Pleasure are people you have fun with. You like to go to the movies, or you like to uh, have over for a meal. You like to have crafts. Something that you come together and you, you, like, you enjoy spending time with. Those are friends of pleasure. Those are the friends that we normally think of, people we sort of like to spend time with. But then Aristotle defines a third kind of friend, a friend of virtue. And I've defined virtue as people who seek your greater good by giving of themselves. And as you can imagine, uh, these are the friends that we have the fewest of because, first of all, most of us were probably not aware of this kind of friendship. And so we're not seeking these kinds of friends. We, we think of, uh, oh, who am I going to meet that I enjoy spending time with? Uh, if you're single, uh, you wonder, who, who is my life partner that I'm going to meet? And I'll actually uh, address that specifically. And finally, uh, the utility, while well, we, we, we go to uh, work, and we have our friends of utility there, we go to church, we go to different groups, and we all come into a relationship with people and yet we've had no way of sorting out the kinds of friends that we have. And so I want to concentrate on one kind of friendship, the friendship of virtue. So just to recap so far, uh, God built into us a need for various kinds of friendship. Uh, without human friendship, we can fail. But friends of virtue are the most important kinds of friendship. And I suggest that this is the kind of friendships we should be consciously, actively pursuing as we meet new people. Adam, Elijah, John the Baptist, and Jesus illustrate the need for friends of virtue. But when we formulate friends of, of virtue, it's a different kind of, of meeting. For example, when we, uh, most of our friends we've probably bumped into, we meet by chance or someone introduces us, but it's not a conscious effort. But whenever I talk about friends of virtue, I talk about the word cultivation. And cultivation requires work. This cultivation where we normally think of planting seeds and then we have to water them, we have to uh, weed and remove uh, unwanted plants. It requires work. Cultivating friendship to virtue requires effort, ongoing effort. And therefore, that's why we have so few of them. That's why it takes a long time to create these friendships of virtue, because we're, we're not going to just bump into them. It's something that we have to actively seek and maintain. Now, here's an interesting uh, tip for or suggestion for those who are looking for a life partner, is that I should, uh, out of those who are looking for the life partner are looking for that friendship, friend of virtue. But they're looking for a friend of virtue that they can marry. And so I've, I've thought about this in uh, late life, and I would suggest that it might be better to create, find friends of virtue first, and then find your life partner from those friends of virtue. Because I, I think anyone who's happily married will tell you that it is very difficult to find that life partner, who is your friend of virtue that you love on an ongoing basis. And quite often we see marriages fall apart because that friendship of virtue has disappeared a long time ago. It, was, it could have easily been a friendship of pleasure and, and utility, but after a few years of stress, there was no virtue to keep the relationship together. So this is uh, just something for the singles who are looking for a life partner. So here are some quotes that I thought would be interesting for a, um, a couple of different ways to look at friendship and virtue. Uh, first, I, I call on Samuel Johnson, which you may have heard about, a very famous uh, English writer and poet from the 1700s, and he 
wrote one of the most influential dictionaries, a dictionary of the English language. I was just in St. Paul's recently, and there's a statue of him uh, inside the, the main area. And he had this very pithy quote that I, I like to remember from time to time. People need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. In other words, we don't need to learn new things necessarily. It's always good to keep learning. But quite often, for our living our daily lives, uh, we need people to remind us. And that is what a friend of virtue is going to do. A friend of virtue is going to remind us of things that we need to be doing. Because sometimes we need to be told what we already know. And uh, that's why we come to church regularly. That's why we're in Bible studies. That's why it's good to talk with Christian friends who can remind us of a particular verse or a particular biblical truth. This is quite possibly the oldest depiction of the Apostle Paul. It dates from the 4th century AD. It's a fresco. It's a painting somewhere in Turkey. And this is the closest I could find from uh, Paul about friendship. He says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. And uh, we probably have at least a friend or two who have left us or gone away because the friends that they were surrounding themselves with are, are either not our kind of friends or they're not good friends and we choose not to associate it but he's, uh, Paul is actually quoting a Greek poet here but the, the, the truth is so true that if you hang around if you spend time with the wrong kind of people it's going to corrupt you, it's going to move you away from the things that you know you want to be doing, whether it be physical or uh, mental, psychological, or spiritual. So this should give us a warning that we need to be spending time with fellow Christians if Christianity is important to us. However, I've saved my last uh, quote from a non-Christian. His name is Jim Rohn, uh, an American entrepreneur, author, and motivational speaker. And I just like the way he phrases it. You are the average of the five people, people you spend the most time with. Now, maybe the five is not the precise number, but I think you understand that the kind of people that you spend the most time with is going to have the most impact on your character, on your development, on your spiritual journey. In other words, your average is going to reflect the people that you spend time with. So, if you want to raise your average, then you need to raise the, uh, the level of the people you spend the most time with. Because where you spend all of your time, that's where you're going to sort of average out at. Now, the reading today was from John 15. And Jesus is now calling his disciples friends. He goes, I no longer call you servants, I, I call you friends. And... <clears throat> I have to, it's, it's important first of all to establish that Jesus is our ultimate friend of virtue. So remember that a friend of virtue is someone who seeks our greater good by giving of themselves. And Jesus has certainly sought our greatest good by giving up his life. I mean, this is where he says, greater love has no man than this, than a man to lay down his life. And so Jesus has given up his life sacrificially. He didn't, he didn't just take a bullet for us. He's going to, he was crucified in order to take our sin away. And, and die a sacrificial death. And he is our ultimate friend of virtue. So we need to have Jesus as our one of our friends of virtue. Great love is knowing that, uh, that this, that to lay down one's life for one's friends, you are my friends, if you do what I command, no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So he's, he's saying that to his disciples, and by extension, he's saying that to all of us here. And hopefully we've all been, become a friend of Jesus, but if not, then the offer stands. And I want to give this very stark contrast. We all know who this guy is. Putin is, Vladimir Putin right now is making uh, billions of people suffer. Actually, probably everybody around the world is suffering because of the actions of this man. And 
you have to ask yourself, is there justice for this man? What could possibly, let's just say that he was captured right now. What could possibly happen to him that will repay all the injustice he has inflicted on this world? I suggest that there's nothing that you can do on this earth that could possibly repay that. And so if we believe in justice, we have to believe in an afterlife with a day of judgment and a judge who looks a lot like God. And Jesus says, I am going to judge. And so we, Jesus, the message of Jesus is he gives us a chance to call us his friend if we believe in him. But if not, he will call us before him to be judged when we die. And Vladimir Putin will certainly be called to be judged when he dies. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're friends of Jesus. But also, I suggest we need friends of virtue to help us improve our friendship with Jesus. So I'd like to sort of summarize and say God created us in the need for human friendship as well as divine friendship. We, we need to respond to God. We have that spiritual desire for God. But we also need our friends of virtue here on earth. Uh, there are failures of faith during times of loneliness when Elijah was not with his friends, when uh, John the Baptist was not with his friends. We see that Jesus he used, needed his friends to help him through uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And we should cultivate our friends of virtue, friends who seek our greater good by giving of themselves. So as we go into the new year, we should think about, well, who do I spend time with? Who should I, who should I be spending time with? Should I be spending time with someone I just met? Maybe there's a friend of uh, virtue there. Should I strengthen current friendships? And maybe, like for example, like my Facebook friends. Do I keep in touch with a Facebook friend that I'll probably never see again, that I'll probably never speak to again? We all have limited time. And I would suggest that we need friends of virtue to help us because when suffering comes, we're going to need those friends of virtue to help us through. Now let me close the prayer. Father God, we thank you for giving us your word today about the fact that you are your son, Jesus, is our friend. We pray that uh, we will seek to encourage others to also become friends of Jesus. But even more so, I pray that we will seek out friends of virtue who can help us become better Christians and encourage us to bear our burdens just as